Hello, and welcome to the Prairie Fiber Witch Podcast. Um, I'm Sarah, uh, coming to you from Edmonton, Alberta, on the Canadian prairies. And this is where I talk about my crafting projects, which, as it's been a while, you can see there's, like, piles of stuff for me to talk about. Um, I don't... I think it's just tiresome to hear, like, oh my god, I haven't been here, I've been doing other things. Um, but, I mean... I haven't been here. I've been doing other things. I've, my summer's been kind of chaotic in the past month or so. Um, everything is going well. Um, nothing to worry about. Um, just been busy and also trying to enjoy some time, um, at my family's lake cabin, which is about an hour out of town. Um, yeah. And my dad took some vacation time. So I actually spent some time sewing out there which is this part of the pile over here. Um, and yeah, what else is new? I got my second vaccine shot, I think. Oh, I can't, now I can't even remember. Was it in June? June, I think I got my second vaccine shot. So double vaccinated. Um, and then what was else was exciting was I bought a fleece. You might have seen, I made a video about scouring the fleece. Uh, the fleece has all been washed and I'm sort of partway through um, carding it into roll eggs. Uh, but I haven't completed that yet and I haven't started spinning yet. Um, I've been a little bit, you know, bouncing around from one project to another. And I still haven't, I didn't quite get my spinning wheel out to the lake because um, I was going to, I had planned to use it out there, but I, instead I did some sewing in anticipation of being a working professional once again. All right, so I made some notes. They are well out of date by now. Um, I think I made them probably a month ago, and um, I have since finished more things since then. So let's get into it. Uh, so what's first on my list here is... This pair of socks, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be reading from my notes because I don't remember a heck of a lot about these socks. These are, um, this is the Faded Rainbow Colorway by Tiny Human Knits. Um, and the, for these socks, I, I think I already talked about my toe-to-toe -to -toe construction, my sock worm thing. And so I did that with these socks t as well. So I started with the contrasting toes well, with a contrasting toe, knit a whole tube, and then ended with another contrasting toe. And then I divided it in half to make two socks and added this ribbing, and then uh, cut in the heels and added the heels. So these are afterthought socks, sometimes called afterthought everything socks or tube socks. The only difference is um, I do not have a knitting machine, so I actually knit these by hand. Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, the Faded Rainbow Colorway, and then the heels and toes are a coordinating mini that Laura of Tiny Human Knits, uh, Laura, probably Laura, not Laura, um, sent me with my order, which was a very lovely surprise, um, and totally unexpected, and then this gold is, um, a mini that I had in my stash that I bought from, uh, Nomadic Yarns. It's a very lovely gold ochre color and it's called Golden. So that's very nice. I knit these on two millimeter needles or a US size zero and I knit the Magic Loop and it was kind of fun to just knit. I've, I, at the time I was really enjoying this sock tube construction and my next pair of socks is also using the same idea um, because I'm I'm actually really enjoying like knitting the tube part, which is fun. So yes, I have, I think four pairs of socks to show you. So that's this first pair. And I'm gonna, the next ones, I actually, these are sort of, these are more my usual like cuff down, heel flap and gusset, um, one at a time socks. Uh, this was, 
part of what I like about the toe to toe construction on those other socks is that um, Laura uh, sells her yarn in 50 gram skeins. And so that allows me to use up like the entire skein to make a pair of socks for myself. Um, yeah, so it's just like a no waste kind of method. And these, this, for these socks, it was a uh, 100 gram skein. The yarn is by Valkyrie Fibers. It's their high twist BFL sock. And the colorway is called This Is The Way, which is their Mandalorian um, inspired colorway. And I just loved this set of stripes when I saw it on Instagram and bought it right away. So yeah, so these ones are cuffed down, one by one rib, heel flap and gusset, stockinette, and then regular wedge toe. Um, yeah. So, and these, I believe, I've been on a magic loop kick. So these were also knit magic loop on two millimeter needles. And uh, yeah. The, the needles that I've been using, two millimeter or a US zero, and the needles I've been using a lot lately are some Addy sock rackets, um, some chow goos, and I just got a pair of um, some Haya Haya sharps, um, which I just started a pair of socks with, and I uh, really like them. Okay, and then my third pair of socks, this is another, um, what I've been calling like tube worm socks because it kind of looks like a worm when you knit it toe to toe, um, is yet another cell striping yarn dyer. This time it's Nomadic Yarns, also a 50 gram skein, but it seems her yardage is a little bit more generous, um, or like the yarn is a slightly different gauge, so you end up with more yards, because uh, these socks ended up being quite tall. And this was, this is on her Tweety base. This is Nomadic Yarns Tweety base, and the colorway is uh, Succulent, Succulents, Succulent Garden. Oh, I didn't actually write it down properly. I can't remember if it's Succulents or Succulent Garden, but it's this lovely, like, I just love these stripes. I really love Ashley's um, stripes and I buy probably far too much of her yarn. Um, this time for the coordinating heels and toes, I used some variegated minis that I had bought from a, from a sock, no, not a sock set. It was a mini set that I bought from Hello Yarn on her, uh, Oh, I don't have the base. I think it's her Merino base. Um, and I, I don't remember, uh, the individual colors I don't think were named. And I don't have it written down what the name of the set was, if it had a name. It was sort of purples and pinks. And this one is a nice, like, in-between kind of purpley pink that I thought went really well with the different tones in here. And then for the cuffs, I used some leftover Fleece Artist Kedazzle which I don't think Fleece Artists is in business anymore. I think they merged with Ma uh, Handmaiden. And yeah, I don't know the colorway. It's sort of this steely blue gray kind of color. These were also knit Magic Loop on, this time I think they were actually knit on a 2.25 millimeter needle or US one, um, because I think I got a, a needle mislabeled. It was a little bit thicker but they still, they fit lovely and I really enjoyed making them. Um, and then one more pair of socks. These were, when I made this list, my list, my show notes, um, I actually was still working on these socks, but I have since finished them. And these are another pair of Nomadic Yarns socks, heavily influenced by Mackenzie, of M to the third, um, be, and her, like, she was posting on Instagram as she was moving across the country and she was knitting a pair of these socks and I was totally influenced to get some of this yarn and to knit up my own pair. These, this is the Reading Rainbow colorway by Nomadic Yarns. Um, I believe it's one of her Pride 
colorways for this year. And, um, I don't know. It's not a true rainbow, but it's still really compelling and I really love it. And like often she'll have these scummy greens in her self-striping socks. So this time, what did I do? Um, well, it looks like I have an afterthought heel in here. I don't think I knit them toe to toe. I think I might've just started at the cuff, worked my way down and then just, um, didn't put in a heel. I don't know if I put in waist yarn where I was going to put the heel or if I just knit a whole long tube and then cut in the heel afterwards. I usually finish these days. I've been coordinating my stripes so that they, unless that it's a 50 gram skein, I've been trying to match up the stripes. Um, cause it's, Sometimes it you luck out and it's you don't have to waste much yarn to do that. So, and they look a little baggy on the sock blockers, but I have um, kind of wide feet, so they fit well. And that's all for my finished socks. Also knit two millimeter needles, US size zero. I'm gonna say Magic Loop. Yeah. All right. And now sweaters. I have finished three sweaters, three sweaters. I have three sweaters here. Um, also, can you tell that it's stash dash? I mean, we're kind of approaching the end of the stash dash, but that's where I've been like driven to finish things. Um, I can't remember which order I finished these in. This is the Sparky Pullover, a design by Andrea Mowry. And this is my like impulse $35 sweater uh, knit out of Briggs and Little Sport. It, the red is called Red Heather and the, and the cream is called uh, Washed White. The red has bled a little bit, but um, it still has good contrast and I don't mind. I mean, it was a $35 sweater, so I don't mind. And we've got little pockets here which was, which were fun to make little pockets and details on the sleeve. Um, the only thing that I found with this sweater was for the size that I knit, which I believe was, I usually knit like a 48, um, inch bust or chest measurement, um, was that I found the neck was really, really wide. And I posted about this on Instagram. So I ended up, after I finished the body of the sweater, I ended up cutting off the ribbing and picking up the stitches just before the first set of increases, because this is knit top down. So just like right underneath the ribbing basically is where I picked up. And then I worked two sets of decreases. Um, I kind of improvised a little bit, but basically what I did was I followed the number of increases that are done later in the yoke in terms of how many per round. And um, instead of, because I think there was like 16 or 18 all at once and it was just too bunchy. So I did fewer decreases and I did more of them. And then I ended up with the stitch count for the smallest size of the sweater. So the smallest neck opening. Um, and I think it fits pretty well. Um, I'll put in some pictures of me modeling these things because um, this is because I have so much to talk about. I don't want to be like taking up too much time putting stuff off and and changing. Um, yeah, so that's what I did. That's the changes that I made that I kind of had to make. And it's happy enough. I'm happy enough with the fit that I will definitely wear it once it's like sweater weather. Um, but I don't know that I would necessarily knit this pattern again or necessarily recommend it because of that. Um, the yoke is a little, the yoke decreases are a little, or increases um, are a little off in my opinion. But the, I mean, the color work pattern is quite striking. So it's kind of a bummer. But I mean, if you know that going into the pattern, you can um, adjust things for yourself. Okay, um, another thing that I did earlier in the summer was, which I was doing, I think it, 
which I like to do from time to time is like I volunteered to test knit something for somebody on Instagram. And this was a test knit for uh, Reed Keys, who is High Fiber Habit on Instagram. And that she designed this awesome brioche sweater, big like chonky sweater with these really interesting, she put like the arm decreases on the outside of the sleeve instead of the inside. So it adds this really interesting volume and it's got a nice little shawl collar. And again, we have pockets, which there's a couple different ways to knit these pockets written in the pattern. Um, and then what else? So because it was a test knit, I pretty much knit two pattern. The only thing that I changed was I didn't have quite enough yardage of my main blue color to do, it has, it calls for a doubled collar. So you knit extra length and then stitch it down. I didn't have enough yardage for that. So um, I just did basically half the collar. And this is yarn from Ursa Yarn Co. Uh, this is their, what's it called? Mouton, which is a uh, sport weight yarn, uh, finger ring or sport weight. I don't know what Urso uh, lists it as, but basically it's Briggs and Little Sport that's been naturally dyed. Uh, I believe this one would probably be with indigo. Um, and because of the gauge of the pattern, I actually held the yarn double to end up with more like an Aran weight, worsted slash Aran weight. And it was like bang on for, um, for gauge for that, which was nice. Um, yeah, so it worked out very nicely. And I like I didn't even have enough yarn. The pockets for this, the insides of the pockets are knit out of a, using a contrast Briggs and Little that I just had on hand, also held double. Um, and for the pockets, there's an option to sort of knit them all at the same time with the body of the sweater and then you join them at the end. Uh, and then you can sort of join them as you go along the sides. Um, I chose not to do that construction method, so I just knit the pocket separately and then stitched down all around the edge. Or wait, did I stitch? No, I think what I did was I knit the body of the sweater and then I went back and I knit the pocket interiors. So then I joined them all together worked the the sort of edging section uh, and then stitched down the sides. I believe that is what I did. And because this is a chonky boy, um, it was knit on six millimeter needles, which is a US size 10. Um, yeah. It was fast. It was a fast one to knit and very enjoyable. I like knitting brioche. Uh, okay. Oh, and I forgot something over there. Just give me a second. Uh, so I forgot I had even knit this, but here it is, and I still have to send it to the recipient. Um, because this is a little tiny baby sweater. This is for the upcoming child of a former coworker of mine who I used to work with, um, who's an artist in Calgary. And, and I used to work with her at a jam kitchen in Montreal. Um, I would label, she was, uh, she worked in the kitchen. I helped by labeling jars, um, labeling and numbering the batches and labeling jars and stuff. Um, and uh, before I used to do that, before I would go and work at the yarn store for a half day. So, yeah. So I chose the best, brightest yarn that I had in my stash, which is from a problematic dyer. So I'm not gonna name it, but it's like, it's like a light highlighter yellow. And the pattern, I mean, maybe you're familiar with this pattern. This is the Flax Light um, by Tin Can Knits. It's part of one of their I think it's the simple collection. It's one of their free patterns. And I think everybody's knit this. I know Amy Florence of the Stranded Pot, Stranded Dye Works podcast. Um, she has knit a whole bunch of these lately. So I think that's probably where I got the idea to make it. And 
I made it nice and quickly. It was, it was like, oh, I saw, I saw the birth announcement, um, on social media and then was like, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should knit something for their baby. Maybe I want to knit a baby thing. And then it was already done. So I still have to mail it off to Calgary, but one of these days. Baby's not due until in it's later in the fall, so we're still good. All right, and the last thing that I have finished, and if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen this um, as I did a fun photo shoot with uh, one of my sewing finished projects, recent sewing finished projects, and was like, um, I called it a pink gnome, pink summer gnome look, which, um, is fairly accurate. I feel like gnomes are just always cold, so wearing a full color work sweater in the middle of, like, July or August wouldn't be so strange for them. Okay, so this is a very old project that I started back in... 2019, I believe like November, December or something. And this is a Norwegian pattern by Sandnesgard Garn, which is called the Valdal Dem Kofta. It might have a number associated with it. I'm not sure. Um, and this I chose to, I chose to make with some yarn that I had in my stash that I've had in my stash for so long. Um, and I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants because I knew I didn't quite have enough yardage of this like background gray color here to do all the ribbing and everything. So what I did was um, when I started the sweater, um, I actually did a provisional cast on and then cast on for the steak separately and then worked the whole body of the sweater. Uh, and this is a drop shoulder construction. So I worked all the body of the sweater, put in armhole steaks and worked up to the top. And then I cut open, um, I, I blocked, I think I steam blocked it before cutting it open, but I cut open for the armholes and then picked up stitches and worked down for the sleeves, which is not how it says to do it in the pattern, uh, but how I wanted to do it so I changed it and uh, I wasn't sure if I was gonna have enough of the gray to do the sleeves um, I originally had stopped and bought like the closest color that they had at, at the local yarn store that was like the same kind of gray which you can see does not exactly match it's a little bit darker um, so I had started casting on the sleeve with that but it was way too noticeable so I decided to take what I had for leftovers of the of my original skein of this gray and I split it in two. So the way that I did that, it was in a cake. I took both ends of the cake and wound it into a ball to get to the other end of it at the middle of the skein um, and then separated that and then wound each of those into two balls, which is probably not the best way of separating a skein into two um, into two balls into two basically but um, it's the best way that I've figured out to make sure to be like really accurate that I have exactly the same in each half basically so in situations where I'm really like cognizant of needing to have precisely half that is the way that I do it um, it's annoying because the yarn gets twisted around each other. Uh, it helps if you have like a staircase that you can put the ball of yarn at the bottom of the staircase and then unwind up a whole distance so that the, that doesn't get all twisted and knotted up like a mess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tedious. Um, not for the faint of heart. And... I also, I had changed the depth of the armholes to fit my sort of, I have wide upper arms here. Uh, so I had changed this measurement to match 
with my measurements. So I ended up, I started with more stitches here. So I ended up working the sleeve kind of one and a half times, or I suppose two and a half because I did two sleeves. Um, I knit for a bit and then realized that I should be decreasing more frequently than I was. I think I had started by decreasing every six rows. So I changed it to every four rows. I actually calculated, um, can't remember if I measured my gauge or not, but like I actually calculated how many rows I wanted the whole thing to be and then how many stitches I wanted to decrease to um, and figured out how frequently I would have to decrease to do that. And it turned out to be precisely every four rows. So that worked out quite nicely. And yeah, so yeah, so I mean, by the time I was doing the ribbing on the cuffs, I had already opened this other skein of yarn that's a, like a slightly different dye lot and a sl slightly different version of Briggs and Little Sport. They have, Briggs and Little has a sport that is 100% wool, and then they have a sport that has nylon in it, uh, which I think is called Tuffy or something, or I don't remember. So this is actually the Briggs and Little Sport that has some nylon in it. And it feels about the same. And I've had people ask questions about like, how soft is Briggs and Little Sport? And I'm like, it's a $7 a skein yarn wool. It's a $7 a skein wool, $7 Canadian. And you get good yardage with that. It's, it's not as scratchy as Icelandic. If you if you're used to knitting with like super wash merino, it's scratchy. Um, my tolerance for scratchiness has sort of changed over the years. I think just because um, I knit, I like knitting with wool. I like working with wool. I like the properties of wool. So, yeah, if you're if you've knit with um, the sort of non super wash. Uh, Scandinavian Norwegian yarns I think they're sort of equivalent yeah oh another inadvertent change that I made which was totally by accident and this is um, when I got to this zigzag chart this is a mistake that I kept making um, often after this point like on the sleeves was that um, I was starting to memorize the logic of this pattern in terms of how it shifts from one row to the next. And um, I just wasn't paying attention as I was doing it. I think I was on a video call at the time. And I just, it's like all of a sudden I was done and then it was different from the pattern. But it's also, it's at the shoulders. I like it's consistent across the th across the whole row so it kind of just looks like I mean my aunt would always say it's not a mistake it's a design feature so I think it's not it's it's not a bad place to have a little bit different in the pattern and you wouldn't even have known if I didn't tell you but as we like to talk about all the things related to knitting the project um, I'm just full disclosure that's what it is and I have uh, I've only I've stitched down the steaks so for that I used some leftover uh, some of the gray I think some of the gray that I used for the button bands because I had very little left of the regular the other gray um, I just whip stitched down the steaks um, and when I do that Sorry, trying to make it so you can see something. When I whip stitch these down along the edge, I try to catch not just the edge of the stitch, but I kind of stitch into the middle of these extra steak stitches. Um, and I try to only catch like the floats on the inside of the sweater so that it's not visible from the front. And I'm just trying to keep it tidy. I'm not trying to make it be super tight or anything. So, um, and the buttons that I used, I have sort of uh, accumulated a little bit of a button stash just because it's nice to be able to pick out some buttons as soon as you finish the sweater and weave in all the ends and be like just done with it all at once now that I have a method of sewing buttons that I like. So yeah, I didn't quite have enough of these green buttons 
and the place that I ordered it from didn't have any more so I just put a different one at the top so again so it looks like a design feature and not some kind of a problem all right so that is everything that I finished and we still have what we're midway through August right And I think Stash Dash is set to, set, set to end at the end of August. Um, and I've reached my goal. I had set a goal of 5,000 meters because I didn't know what my summer was going to be like. And when I first did Stash Dash, um, I was able to achieve 5,000 meters before um, with relative without a lot of stress. So I thought that that would be achievable again. And like we're into year two of global pandemic and I didn't know what my summer was going to be like, whether I was going to be working full time or not, or working customer service. Um, I'm not sure. So, um, so far I have met my goal and gone over a little bit. So with all of these sweaters that I finished and all of these pairs of socks, I am now at 6,164 meters for Stash Dash. So I have met my goal and I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah, so I've that's kind of what let me um, take some time to do some sewing. And I guess this one's in progress, but I'll show you the other two right now since they are finished. Um, I started, I took, oh, where to start with this? I do sew. Um, it's been a while since I've sewn much of anything. I think the last time I made some stuff was, was it last, ew, January, just before the pandemic, I think. I made a couple of linen dresses. Um, I've been slowly hoarding linen over the past three or four years, um, high quality linen. I got, I was very fortunate that my, that my parents bought me some lovely Merchant and Mills linen, um, which comes from England. Well, the linen, I don't know that it's produced in England, but it, the shop is in England that it comes from. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, it's a fancy, they have fancy linens and they have all these fun checks and stripes and stuff. So these over here are Merchant and Mill linens. And then this particular linen that I used for these pants um, came from uh, Rick Rack Textiles in Calgary. And I can't remember, it's like a year, I think it was, it's last year sometime I bought the fabric for this. Uh, and I didn't have anything specific in mind. I usually buy like three meters because that means I could make like a dress or something, which is usually what I make. I make a lot of summer dresses. I first learned to sew when I was the summer before grade seven. My mom decided my brother and I were gonna learn how to sew. And uh, we got set up at the lake. We would come in to buy fabric and patterns and things. And my aunt, um, uh, was an avid sewer since like high school and um, she was responsible for teaching us how to like follow a pattern and how, how to build something um, that you could wear on your body. Not a lot necessarily focused on fitting but so but more about like what the instructions mean and what the construction how the construction works so. And at that time we were like, I don't think there were any independent patterns, certainly like, I'm trying to think of when was I in grade seven? Um, like or mid nineties. So like mid nineties, there, there wasn't much of, we, we hadn't, the internet hadn't hit where we were yet. That was a, a couple of years later when I was in grade nine was like, you know, the GeoCity days just to age myself a little bit. Um, yeah, so I made some pants. And I have definitely uh, been inspired by versions by Jacqueline Cieslak and um, Amy Bath of the Fat Squirrel 
and uh, Susan of the Knit Lib podcast, she has made many versions of these pants. Um, I think she was making them like basically her summer uniform. These are the Arthur pants. And I'll put in a little, like some pictures so you can see them on my body, on my human body. And these are glorious. They are very comfortable. Um, I have yet to wear them in public uh, for reasons that I'll get into. And they were fun to make. That's the first time um, that I have made some a garment with like flat felled seams, which you can you can see there, and like these big, lovely big pockets, and then patch pockets on the back. I mean, I've definitely sewn patch pockets before. This is the first, I think this is the first time that I've done a zipper fly, which I will unzip for you. Oh my gosh. And show you the insides. Um, I do have a serger, uh, but I didn't have it with me. I just had a sewing machine that we brought out to the lake with the intention of sewing curtains, which I then told my mom were too boring to sew. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, these were a lot of fun. Uh, I made the size 20 to fit up my natural waist and I am a short potato, so I shortened the pattern. Now, the one thing with this pattern was I think, I'm pretty sure, I am quite certain that the leg length in the finished measurements chart is wrong and telling you the wrong lengths of the pants. Um, and just the way that the, because these are sort of like a, a balloon leg pant, so it kind of curves out like this, at the bottom where your hem is, is also curved, and so it's shaped a certain way to make the hem work properly. Um, so if you're gonna adjust the length of the pants, you have to, you have to think about it beforehand, before you cut your fabric, because you, um, you need to move that special shaping to where you need it to be. So I was like measuring the pattern pieces and trying to figure out, like I don't have a dress form or anything, um, to tr having my mom try and measure to figure out how long they should be and not having, I can't remember, I think I made some pants when I was in grade, in the summer before grade seven, but I th can't remember if they were pants or just like culottes or something. It was definitely a culottes era. Um, but yeah, it's been a while. That's many, many years ago. Um, so yeah. So those was my first time doing a zipper fly, which was um, a little bit stressful. Uh, and pants are definitely more complicated to make than a dress because um, even without major fitting, style to it and um i like to do a certain amount of hand finishing so like the for the inside of the waistband i actually hand stitched down the waistband and when i was having a different dress that i made during our like little few weeks at the lake i uh i i put a little video on instagram of how i hem it's kind of like a it's not, I mean, it might be an official stitch. I don't know what it is as an official stitch, but that's just if you're curious as to how I hem things. It's sort of a stitch that I extrapolated from knowing how to, um, n how to do needle turn applique. I took a needle turn applique course class um, one year with my brother when we went to Hawaii. And uh, so that's one of the main hand stitches that I've like officially learned how to do. And so I sort of adapted that when I was hemming, when I hem things. And okay, what is the, so the thing that I haven't worn these in public yet is that um, there's something weird with the tension on the sewing machine that I was using because like I wore the pants for an evening and Ugh, can you see that there? The stitches popped. It's always a fun thing, um, probably for a person of any size, but to be like a kind of kind of fat person 
and then like sit down in a pair of pants and just hear pop 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 so the um center back seam like the butt seam the crotch seam had popped in multiple places i have since fixed that um and i have to sort of work myself up to fix fixing the like center leg seams because it, I think I have to take the pockets off and undo the hem a little bit to fix it. I'm, I was really bummed about that. And then also the dress that I made next also had like a seam that popped immediately. So um, I played around a lot with the tension on the sewing machine uh, for the next project that I made. I think it needs to be like the bobbin case I think needs to be oiled or something because it's being inconsistent which is not good um, this is not a sewing machine that I usually sew with it is um, my mom's like 1970s fav I usually sew with I got I have a, fe a singer featherweight that I got from a family friend um, like eight years ago now I think and I love sewing with it. If you have, if you see a Singer Featherweight in good shape at like a junk sale and it's a good price, um, I, it's worth taking it to a machine shop and or like a sewing machine shop and see if they can get it working again because it sews like a dream. And especially if you can get a buttonholer. I freaking love the buttonholer on the Featherweight. Oh my God. It's this weird like contraption that you like force onto the machine and it has these little templates to to do all the buttonholes and like you need a template for the size of button hole that you're trying to make because it only makes like one size per template and oh man are they nice buttonholes and you just like you just put your pedal on the machine and it'll just make it it's awesome <sighs> highly recommend Okay, so that was a lot about those pants. But some of that was spill over to this dress. So this is the So Liberated Hinterland dress. I have, uh, I think a couple of years ago, the last time that I sewed anything, which I think was a couple of years ago now, um, I had made two of these dresses out of some other linen. Uh, and I have slowly accumulated, I have like a whole pile of linen. I have, let's see, I had seven, I had like seven different linens in, in amounts enough to make a garment. Um, and, uh, so I made three of them. So I have four more pieces of linen, much of which were earmarked for more of these dresses. Although I'm, I mean, it's basically my uniform, I guess. This one, when I did a little photo shoot with it on Instagram, um, I said that it was sort of my uh, goth witch in inspired um, like woolen forest kind of look. And um, yeah, I think it's totally like Maria's style and I'm just shamelessly stealing it in when I wear this dress. Um, yeah, I wish I were as cool as Maria. And here we go. This is my attempt to cosplay as Maria. Um, uh, did I change anything about this dress? I think the only thing I change about when, when I make the hinterland dress is I have the length is a little different. And I modified the sleeve, um, to be a little bit larger so that it fits my arms, which is something that I often have to look at with sewing or knitting patterns is like, what are the arms gonna fit like around my biceps? So this is um, some Merchant and Mills linen. Um, I think it's called Mrs. Lewis is the pattern and they've had it for many years, this particular check. And it's actually like, it kind of looks like, from far away, it kind of looks black, black and white but it's actually like a natural linen and black. So it's like even more goth witchy. I love it. Oh, and these are more buttons from my stash of buttons. I think most of the buttons that I had bought were from, I think textile garden in the UK. 
I just went through um, a few years ago and bought a bunch of ones that I liked and um, yeah I've got a little stash now. So while we're still talking about sewing I am going to continue to talk about sewing uh, and the one thing that I kind of haven't finished yet which I would like to finish today because I kind of want to wear it tomorrow is this hinterland dress. Um, just so another version. This time I adjusted it to be, I uh, wasn't paying attention when I was pinning the fabric to, or pinning the pattern to the fabric and I had it folded down the, all the way so this one was actually cut to the full length but I'm making like can you see that? I'm making a nice deep hem. I think it's a two and a half inch hem to try and eat up some of that length. Um, the length of the other one is like just just like at my knee. So this one will probably be a couple inches lower than the knee. Um, because, oh, I didn't say this on the other one. Because I didn't have my sewing with, uh, my serger with me, um, I was sewing French seams on this garment. And the one thing that I tried with the black and gray one that I also did on this one was I did like a flat felled seam for this like sh shoulder arm seam, which works out pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with that. And then um, another change that I made, see I've already, I put in my buttonholes. These are not the buttonhole or buttonholes. These are the ones that the FAF does. Um, but I also, instead of machine stitching this down, I also hand stitched it. And then I'm just working through and hand stitching the hem. I had this great plan this week that I was gonna like stitch down the hem and sew on the buttons immediately and then magically have the energy to like cut out another dress so that I could sew another one this weekend. None of that has happened. Um, I've most of the way through the hem I think I have, let's see here, um, oh look, I only have a little bit left on the hem, I only have this much to do, um, and then I have the buttons to sew on, and then I can wear it, okay, so that is definitely doable for tomorrow, and this linen is again, it was a Merchant and Mills linen, I think it's like Suzy Stripe or something like that. Uh, it was a Christmas present a few years ago from my parents. They bought me, uh, I think, three pieces of, of linen, which are all fabulous. And I love, I'm, it's like one of my best presents I've ever had. And I, it's been sitting around too long not being used, so I'm very happy to have this. Although I was really debating whether I wanted to make another hinterland dress or if I wanted to make the CeeLo dress by Closet Core Patterns. I have the pattern for that one. I just haven't cut it out. And um, I was like really debating. I, yeah, I'm definitely going to make, I feel like I have to make a striped one of that at some point. And then I can use a different one of the wonderful stripes that Merchant and Mills um, cells. So that's all the sewing that I've done, which is the most sewing that I've done in a really long time. Uh, when I lived in Montreal, I had a really nice setup for sewing in my last apartment there. And I used to just like Saturdays was like my sewing day or like I would just do a weekend. There was one like a long weekend that I just like sewed like three dresses all from the same pattern. Bing, bang, boom, got them done. It's been a long time since I've done that. One day. Um, other knitting projects. Oof. Other knitting projects. Here's some knitting. Okay, this is... Oof. This is the Ardea Tea by Kenzni... I'm sorry for pronouncing this improperly. I should have looked it up. Uh, Kinesia Nadon, I think. Um, 
And this I am knitting out of Noro Khaki Gori in color number six, which when I went to buy the extra yarn for the Sparky sweater, Sparky pullover um, at the yarn store, I saw the balls, the, the skeins of this, which were giant. Um, and I just was like, oh my God, what is this? And so I bought it and then um, me and a friend of mine are sort of, um, we're both knitting this. Um, she's using the yarn that's called for the, in the pattern. I'm using this yarn, which I quite like. So this pattern is, it's kind of like playing snakes and ladders. Um, if you are familiar with that board game. So it is knit sideways and then you do all these sort of different texture zones and different sort of stitches. And um, sometimes it be, can be a little bit confusing as to where you are in the pattern. So, uh, I mean, for me, it helps to just uh, concentrate and just like work on it solidly. And then you get a, and then I get a whole bunch of it done and I can keep track of where I am. Um, but I finished the first half, uh, which took a while and I have started the second half, but I haven't worked a lot on it. I had just started it and then, um, then I got, then life got busy. So I think it's been, I think we're going to week three of not really having touched it much. So, but I love the yarn. The yarn is like a cotton silk blend. Um, and it doesn't like, it's interesting cause it's mostly a solid but then the secondary color, it does do the Noro thing where like the secondary color kind of switches out. So there's sort of zones where it's more bluish or yellowish or, or sort of peachy. Um, it's very nice. I really enjoyed this yarn and it's nice to work with. There has been one knot and it's not really noticeable because it is a, sol a very subtle color change. Um, I don't know what needles I'm knitting this on. Let me look. Can I see? Can I see? These are on, this is on, oh, a 3.5 millimeter needle, which is a US size four. There you go. There you go. There's some yarn information for you. And now lastly, we have some socks in progress which I don't have written down. So we're uh, gonna see what I remember. <clears throat> this is, I started these earlier. I think I, I probably, usually when I finish a pair of socks, I'll like immediately cast on another pair of socks because I like knitting socks. This is a colorway by the Co Cozy Knitter. It was a sock set, so it was like, um, it was a skein. I'm not sure, did she do like a 70 gram skein or something of the stripes and then like a 20 gram skein for the heels and toes? Um, which is, this is the same blue that is in the stripe. And this colorway is called Be My Bell. Ooh, I could put this on a, oh, my sock blockers under a pile of stuff now. I'm not going to try and go and find it. This is a color that my mom picked out. She was like, oh my gosh, I love this. And then when the yarn arrived and I started knitting the socks, she was like, you can't knit that. Those are my colors. And I was like, dummy, they're for you. Um, yeah, so there we go. So I am almost done these socks. I'm just about to start the toe decreases on the second sock, which I'm happy about. These are little shorty socks uh, my, because my mom likes wearing hand knit socks when she goes golfing because they prevent her from getting blisters. Uh, yeah, those Magic Loop, as you can see, these are like the Addy sock rockets, which I don't know if you can tell, but my needles are have, they get bent a little bit and they're both worn with like some copper or something showing. So 
Um, I think I'm going to retire these ones pretty soon. I've been knitting a lot with them. Uh, and that's, so those are US zeros. No, yeah, US zero, uh, two millimeter. And then my mom is very lucky because both of my socks, so both of the pairs of socks that I'm knitting right now are for her. These are um, some tiny human knits, which this is her banana sock set. So it has this like little yellow self striping with like a speckle. You can see the speckle. Um, and then coordinating green that I'll use for heels and toes. Uh, this is again with because Tiny Human Knits does a 50 gram skein. I'm going to knit a tube. This time I'm going to do a cuff to cuff tube and then uh, cut in for heels and toes with the green. These are the higher, higher sharps that I got recently. And US zero size two millimeter. Yeah, I've been de dealing with some back pain. So for the past couple days in the evening, I've just been like lying flat on my back on my bed um, and knitting, <laughs> knitting a sock. So <laughs> it's kind of boring, but what are you gonna do? All right, so that's all the socks. And there's one more thing of what I am planning to start knitting. I really wanted to cast it on last week, but I decided that I had to buy some different yarn for it. Here is a swatch that I started last week, the week before, I think last week. Oh gosh, get these double points out of the way so you can see. Ooh, does that even look anything? I mean, you can probably see what the issue is here, which is that there is a green here, and there is also this brown sort of fawn color. And unless you're in kind of bright light, you can't really, I mean, up here you can see it a little bit better, but the color doesn't, there's not great contrast. And this is a, uh, oh, I don't have the pattern here. This is the, this is uh, like my, Second time swatching for the Marit cardigan, I think by, I think it's by Sari Nordland, um, that was in Lane Magazine issue something or other. Um, and the first time I had decided to, um, I was gonna use a cream color, but then I think it's because I saw Cozy Cardigan's version I'm not sure of her name off the top of my head, um, but I saw her version that she's working on with the actual called for um, main color, and I really liked it. I thought it might be a nice contrast to this naturally dyed green and yellow um, that I got from the Alberta Yarn Project, I think now two years ago. I've always intended them for this sweater, um, but I, I just got to get that right color combo. And yeah, these are too close to each other, too close. Um, but the one, this is not the color that's actually called for in the pattern from Tuku Wool. Um, it's a, there's a slightly different sort of tawny, brownie, brown mixed with white kind of color um, that they use instead that I think is a little bit lighter. And it really depends on the website that you look at and the pictures. I think it's lighter. So I have some of that coming in the mail and um, I'm gonna recast on using that as the main color. I had just gotten, I had one ball of this that I was using in a different project um, that I had kicking around. So I thought I would use it for a swatch to see if I liked it better than the cream that I had was planning to use. But yeah, I think it needs better contrast than that. So that's sort of like a almost started project. So I expect that yarn should show up sometime in this next week. And I will shove all these random balls of yarn back in here. Get this other double point added to the pile. Whew. All right. 
Whew. So that's everything that I'm, I've been making in the past while and everything that I'm working on right now. I have read like 10 books. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them, uh, because we're already clocking in an hour. I might mention some of the, like, more interesting ones. I read the new Kazuo Ishiguro, Clara and the Sun. So good. It was so good. I really loved that one. Another one that I really loved. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. E. Schwab. I had read V.E. Schwab's um, The Darker Shade of Magic. I read the first book and a half or something. Um, I really enjoyed that. Of uh, A Gathering of Shadows, I think is the first one. Um, I really enjoyed that, but like this, um, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is like a completely different world, completely different um, setup and tone. It was just, it was like a beautiful book. Like, Clara and the Sun was also a beautiful book. And I've been, uh, I'm jumping around here, but here we go. Um, but like, I've become a big fan of Kazuo Ushiguro. Many years ago, I read Never Let Me Go. And then a couple years ago, I read The Buried Giant, or in the last year, was it? Really loved it. Um, and they're like, they're so different from each other. And I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't always expect an author to like try and write the same book over again because in that case you could just reread it, I guess. Um, but, and it's not like, it's not like a series or anything, so you wouldn't expect a continuation of the world, but I've heard like some people talking about, oh, that Claire and the Sun is like not exactly like Never Let Me Go, but it's like, but none of his books are like each other. He also wrote Remains of the Day, which is like a totally different story again. So yeah, whatever. Um, yeah. What else did I read? I've read some comics. Um, I think the most interesting comic that I read so far in the past little while was Cyclopedia Exotica by Aminder Dhaliwal. It's uh, published by Drawn and Quarterly. And I was a part of um, the ALA's virtual conference for this year um, because it was affordable and I wasn't working, so I might as well do it. And um, I saw her and like her, her, the Drawn and Quarterly talks at ALA were very interesting. So I just got a whole bunch of comics from them out from the library to read. And uh, yeah, that was one of the more notable ones. So, I mean, um, so Amanda, she publishes comics on Instagram and then um, they get collected into, into a book when they're done. That I think she's this like her, she's working on a new story right now. So that would be her third way of doing that and I think she works in the animation industry in LA um yeah I think we're gonna leave it there because that's that's kind of a lot of stuff that's a, like there's a big pile over here I don't know can you it's like it's almost as high as my it's almost here anyway big pile of stuff I'm going to see if I can finish hemming that thing and then I can wear it. I have a job interview tomorrow, so, um, yeah. All right. I hope you have been having a good summer, um, or as good as you can where you are with, um, the, our current pandemic situation and that you've, you know, had some time outside, even though we've been experiencing a lot of smoke the the past few weeks. We have, there's a fire going on that's, uh, that's fairly close to town here. So it's been quite smoky the past few days. Um, yeah, I mean, well, that's a happy note to end on. Anyway, I hope you're doing well, as well as you can be doing, and that you're enjoying your crafting. 
and I'm not gonna make any promises of when the next one of these is gonna be because my life is very chaotic right now um, but hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later thanks so much for watching and thanks for sticking with me